teach through uh, what have been identified as the three stages of the trivium, uh, the three stages of thought for young people, the grammar stage, the logic stage, and the rhetoric stage. And in senior thesis, I teach the students to do two things, and this comes from Aristotle. I teach them to master, or at least I try to teach them to master the dialectic, and that is the art of using logic and evidence and commonly agreed upon ideas and propositions to come to true inferences and conclusions. And then rhetoric is the ability to do two things. One, to persuade people of what you found true in the dialectic, but also to explain the dialectic to people who have trouble following close argumentation, is how Aristotle puts it. And so you're not just going to be hearing research papers, you're going to be hearing people to try to persuade you of the results of their research. That doesn't mean that they won't be logical, it just means that you're not going to hear a bunch of formal syllogisms. Does that make sense? You can say yes or no, it's okay. Yes, yes that's fantastic. And as you watch the speech, you're going to notice some things up here. Some of the students have opted to make PowerPoints, that's optional. Uh, so if you see a PowerPoint up here that is not filled with a lot of pizzazz, that's something that I've done to just try to help you follow the stages of a classical speech in light of what you would see if you were holding the speech in your hand. Most of these, none of the ones you'll see today are the product of the student. Also, that means that any errors are mine, not the student's. But the point is to help you follow some things, and you'll see some words you've never seen before, perhaps. Exordium. How many of you have heard that word? Thank God. <laughs> Neratio, propositio, probatio, refutatio. You're going to see a word up there for Shiloh, it's called paranesis. Okay? And what these are are segments of speeches. An exordium is when the, the person uses a quote or a commonly known thing or something about themselves to relate themselves to you. The narratio is where they give you the narrative leading up to why they chose the topic or perhaps the background information you need to understand the topic. They will define their terms. They will tell you why it's important. The propositio is the thesis statement. You all know what that is. A probatio, that is the probative value of the speech. It's the argumentation for their thesis. They will be telling you, here's why I think my thesis statement is true, and here's why you should think it as well. There is a part of the speech called the refutatio, where they look at opposing points of view and hopefully ground them into power with logic and skill. Finally, you will see the para-ratio, a final emotional and moral appeal to rouse your emotions, affections, and attentions to either agree with them, or disagree with a bad idea, or simply to get up out of your seat and do something. And then in Shiloh, you'll see a brief segment called Paranesis. What Paranesis is in the ancient world is a list of moral imperatives based on a previously stated proposition. And Shiloh will try to tell you in her speech what she wants you to do. Hopefully almost every sermon you've heard has had one. If there are any questions, you'll have to ask me afterward, because now is the time the students will be giving speeches, and the judges will then ask them questions. Good afternoon. I'm Austin Ivy Jones, and I'm a junior here at NACUS. Today, I have the wonderful opportunity of introducing a great friend. She has played volleyball with me for three years, and is one of the sweetest girls I have ever met. She plans on attending Del Mar College next year to major in nursing and dreams of one day becoming a pediatric nursing practitioner. Today, she will be informing you on a Christian's response to property taxes. Please join me in welcoming Abigail Leanne Owens.
Singh said, despite the difficulties of extra tax and private tuition, subsidizing public education is a provisional good from a Christian point of view. The information I'm about to share with you is the foundation of my argument. For the benefit of you as the audience, I will use and define several terms such as public compulsory education, subsidization, provisional, prosperity, tax, and property tax. Public compulsory education, which is required by law, as we know it today, did not begin to exist until the 1840s. Education is a process of receiving or giving systematic instruction. The way it is taught and the way it is funded has changed over the years. To subsidize is to support financially, and provisional means existing for the present but possibly to be changed later in the future. Now that I have defined some terms, let me repeat my thesis. Despite the difficulties of extra tax and private tuition, subsidizing public education is a provisional good from a Christian point of view. Now, what do education and subsidization have to do with each other? Well, I would like to clear the air and address why public education should be subsidized. This has been a debate since the public schools were created of whether or not citizens who choose not to enroll their children in a public school should be paying property taxes Support it. While a tax is a fee charged by a government on a product, income, or activity, a property tax is a tax assessed on real estate by the local government. Property tax is usually based on the value of the property, including the land that you own. Owning property requires you to pay property taxes. The majority of those property taxes go toward public schooling and education. The property tax allocation for Clark County says that 41% of the state of Washington's property taxes went toward its local schools in 2012. Similarly, in the state of Nevada, 34% of its property taxes went toward its local schools in Douglas County. Although not all schools are equal, America spends over $500 billion a year on public elementary and secondary education. The Federal, federal Education Budget Project explains the three types of funding for public education. All three levels of government, federal, state, and local, contribute to education funding. States typically provide a little less than half of all elementary and secondary education funding. Local governments generally contribute about 44% of the total, and the federal government contributes about 10%. The share of education funding that federal, state, and local governments provide has changed significantly. Federal funding has always been minor in respect to the total amount of education spending, though the federal government's role in education funding and policy has slowly increased. Historically, public education was funded largely by local governments, and states only played a supporting role. This shows that our local property taxes are gradually becoming less and less important in the public school funding. In general, we think of state schools also known as public schools or government schools, as referring to primary or secondary schools, which are offered to all children by the government. These schools are paid for in whole or in part by public funding from taxation. State schools may also refer to institutions of post-secondary education. However, I am only focusing on primary and secondary education, not post-secondary. According to the Texas Education Agency, as of the 2010-2011 school year, Without public schools, Texas alone would have 4,933,617 students no longer enrolled in an educational system. And this number is increasing every year by, by, by about 1.8%. What would our society look like without almost 5 million students between the grades of pre-kindergarten and 12th grade not receiving an education? I've now told you that without the public school system and 5 million students not in school, that we wouldn't be a prosperous society. But what exactly is a prosperous society? Cultural prosperity depends on its access that citizens have to knowledge. This includes both access to basic literacy skills, math and science, history, geography, and so forth. In addition, access to knowledge must be universal and available to all ages. Being a prosperous society comes from having universal access to knowledge. Biblically speaking, a prosperous society has moral integrity, 
knowledge, and material goods. From this, we see that if we have 5 million students in schools, we will have a more prosperous society than if we didn't. Taking all of these facts into consideration, we now know that we benefit from having a public school system. Again, how do we know that education is so important? Well, the countries in the world that have become prosperous fall into two different categories. Neil Buchanan, professor of law at George Washington University, says that the first category includes those nations that possess large amounts of valuable natural resources. The second group of countries, a much larger one, is composed of countries that have educated their citizenry into prosperity. Nearly all of the countries that have long been the wealthiest in the world reached or have maintained that status with a commitment to higher education. Even the most resource-poor countries of Northern and Western Europe have enjoyed much higher living standards than many resource-rich countries that do not devote themselves to educating their young people. This proves that having education as a main priority makes for a prosperous country. Many countries have wisely followed this lead of making education a priority. Taiwan, for example, is a resource poor nation that has become an economic powerhouse. Buchanan quote the Taiwanese diplomat who recently wrote, Taiwan's economic achievement is based on education. We believe that education is the bedrock of a nation's competitiveness. This is true. Education is the foundation to a competitive, prosperous society. Without education, societies would suffer and have no foundation to grow economically, which is a hindrance to everyone in society. By listening to Neil Buchanan and seeing how different countries who have put education as a priority have prospered, we now see and understand that education is important. In the past several minutes, I have explained history of the public school system, how they are funded, and examples of other nations' prosperity. From that, I can now move on to my first point. We need to ask ourselves, who should pay for education? The people who benefit from it should pay for it, correct? Buchanan goes on to say that education is good not just for the person who becomes educated, but also for everyone around her. Citizens are more productive when they are able to contribute to the economy in ways that benefit others far beyond the salaries that they receive. You may be wondering, what is the purpose of a public school system? Is it used to create citizens, keep jobs, and socialize us? Maybe, but without public school, there would be no citizens to help others. There would be no prosperity. How do we benefit from it exactly? Well, we benefit from the public school graduates who graduate from college every year and are a huge part of our society. They become doctors, dentists, nurses, lawyers, mechanics, and more. Taxpayers want every child in the community to be well educated, not just their own children. Taxpayers want the mechanic who repairs their car to be well educated. They want the nurse's aide who cares for their parents in their nursing home to be well educated. They want the bank teller who handled their transactions to be well educated. Without going to public schools, many of these students could not have graduated and gone to college to become useful members in our society. After the 2011-2012 school year, 86% of the high school seniors in Texas graduated. Of that 86%, 66% enrolled into college or university, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Without education and education, our society, our society would plummet. Since we benefit now or in the future from students being educated in the public schools, we should subsidize the education we are benefiting from. With that, the first reason why we should pay our public school taxes is because we as a whole benefit from a system directly and that our society is in place. The second reason why we should pay our taxes, even if we don't use the system, is because we are choosing not to partake in it. Public schools have been around since the 1800s, and we are choosing to send our children to private or charter schools, or choosing to homeschool them, and not use the education that has been offered to us in public school form. This does not make us exempt from the taxes just because we are choosing not to use them. The Coalition for Public Schools explains that parents pay once for the education of their child when they pay tuition for private school. What parents pay in school property taxes provides educational opportunities for all children. Parents who enroll their children in private school are not being taxed a second time. Rather, they have made a free choice to purchase a private service that is
is separate from the societal obligation that they share with their neighbors. This obligation provides public schools the ability to educate the public as a whole. In all, since private school families are choosing not to partake in the public education they are offered and are choosing to pay tuition for private schools, there is no need to re refuse to pay the property taxes going toward public education because it is their choice. Now we understand that we should pay our property taxes for the public schools because one, we benefit, and two, we made a free choice not to use it. Now for the third and most clearly evident reason why we should subsidize public school education is around 500,000 teachers in Texas, not including janitors, cafeteria workers, coaches, etc., would instantly be unemployed if we quit subsidizing through property taxes. Not to mention, 3.3 million teachers in total would be unemployed. No, not all the money for public schools is being made through local property taxes, but the majority is. According to Mark Dixon in his Public Education Finances of 2010, the District of Columbia, for example, the majority of their education funding comes from their local revenue. The rest comes from their federal work. Around 85% of the funding in D.C. comes from their local taxes. Without their local taxes, D.C. would not have the opportunity for the sake of this argument, with around 4 million people being unemployed and receiving no income, what does this say for America as a whole? This would lead to problems for everyone. If that many people have no income, they can't buy from the economy. If they can't buy from the economy, then people working in other industries cannot obtain a profit. If other industries don't get a profit, then they go out of business. When they go out of business, people with needs that that business met are left without. In all, stopping property taxes that subsidize public education would lead to economic loss. Now, the fourth and most clearly evident reason why we should subsidize public schools is this. If you're a Christian, it is your duty to obey lawful authority and pay your taxes. In 1 Peter 2, 17, 2 12-17, Peter generally says to live such good lives among pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. He says to submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or to governors, who are sent by them to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God and honor them. In Romans 13, 6 and 7, Paul says, This is also why you pay your taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to govern. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. An interpretation of Romans 13 would be that we should pay our taxes, not just for the governments who we find appealing, but to all governments. The commentary of the Epistle of the Romans Leon Morris explains that the paying your taxes and submitting to authority is everyone's duty. He says that Paul is referring to a universal duty. He makes no distinction between non-Christian and Christian. This is a duty incumbent on all people, simply as people. Here we see that it is our, it is our Christian duty. Leon Morris then goes on to explain that Paul wants his readers to be law-abiding citizens, assuring them that they will be committed. He shows that every human authority figure is appointed by God, and in the end, no matter the circumstances now, God has a plan and good will come of the situation. This being said, we must respect authority and follow their law. Even though I've given you four reasons of why we should subsidize our public schools, you still may be barking at me in the back of your mind and maybe thinking, citizens who don't have any children aren't choosing not to use the public school system because they have no children to enroll. So why should they pay their taxes that go through the public school system? I already said that they benefit from the public school from being in a prosperous society. Secondly, the Bible says to pay your taxes, and that's really the only reason needed. Now, what if citizens aren't complaining about the taxes themselves, but how they're used? Because taxes will be taxed anyways, the matter is what they're used for. That's not your call. For example, you can't dictate the class or how it's done until you become a teacher. Would you want your students to tell you how to teach your class? With this, if you want the taxes used differently, 
You should become a part of the authority who makes those decisions. If you wanted to change, you should make a change. As I said before, it's our universal duty to pay our taxes. And we should In addition to that, some other people may be saying that the public school systems are bad and they should be terminated. Well, I have three reasons of why we can't just terminate them immediately. First, we benefit from it in the long run, so why would we want it gone? Second, as Mr. Ross said, eating Twinkies every day of their life is bad, but it's better than eating nothing. In the same case, some education is better than no education. Now, for my last argument, remember how I told you that our property taxes are becoming less important? Well, guess what? In the future, it may be wise to get rid of the subsidization of the public school system. However, it is necessary provisionally until we can demonstrate a better alternative for public education. The Federal Education Budget Project said that local subsidization is slowly decreasing. This tells us that in the future, we are gradually getting to the point where our property taxes can be used for something different. This factor showed those who oppose property taxes being used for public schools that maybe sometime in the future, they will get their wish. However, as is, we should still subsidize public schools until a better alternative is thought. For example, if you've ever been on a boat, you may have thought about being on a sinking boat. Well, I believe it is better to be in a slowly sinking boat with holes in it while signaling for help, rather than abandoning the ship and losing safety altogether. Right? This being said, the sooner we find a better alternative, we build a new boat, before the public school system collapses, the better. Rather than saying, the sooner it collapses, or the sooner it sinks, the better. With this, in the future, it would be wise to stop the subsidization of public schools. But for now, it is a provisional good, because one, we benefit in the long run, two, some education is better than none, and three, we have yet to build up a better alternative for our sinking boat. We should pay our property tax for the public school system, not only because God says to, but also because our, we benefit from it. We are choosing not to partake in it, and without the public schools, immediately we would be at an economic loss. In conclusion, not only should we subsidize public schools for these reasons, but also because God says to care for and help those around us. By paying these taxes, we are benefiting both us and those in our society. With that, I hope you understand why and are willing to subsidize the public schools. We now know why we cannot just terminate the public school system immediately, and that despite the difficulties of extra tax and private tuition, subsidizing it is a provisional good. The question now is, how will we respond in knowing that we need to pay our taxes and that they are only provisional? As Christians, we have two options. We could, one, say it's none of our business and it doesn't matter what happens in the public school system because we don't like it anyways, or two, we could take action. As Christians, we should accept the fact that the public school system is not good and take action in finding that better alternative that will later take the place of the public school system. We could better educate the public school participants in showing them a better understanding of God and His Word. Mark 12, 31 says to love your neighbor as yourself, which can be shown in different ways. One way could just be to persuade others in better directions or educate and give others a better understanding of the wrong inside public. It is our Christian duty to support and assist the education of the young, and I believe by taking action, educating the public school participants, leading others in better directions, and helping to find the better alternative that we are responding to.
be, uh, I don't know, maybe challenging to some of our uh, preconceptions and assumptions and things. So um, I do uh, uh, appreciate you challenging us on that. Um, I'm going to just ask a few questions uh, initially. I'm curious about um, the context uh, for your talk. Um, in your uh, thesis, what, what are you asking us um, to, uh, to believe or to do that, if, if, let me see if I can even be more clear. Um, you're asking us to, are you asking us to um, just agree with the fact that we have to pay property taxes to support public education? Um, are there, that's one question, are there people out there that are refusing to pay their property taxes, or is there a movement against this that is, you know, gaining prominence or posing a threat or something like that? The two questions there. I'm saying that we should be willing to pay our taxes for the public school system, and I've heard we should have to pay them because we already pay enough for a private school tuition. So why? Okay, so is it enough though that we be unwilling but still do it? You know, in other words, I mean, I don't, are, is, are there people out there who have refused to pay? Um, are, are you arguing that they should just, um, that they should do it with a cheerful spirit and, and, and believe that what they're doing is good? Is that, the, is that your point? Okay, so it's, it's one of, our attitude towards, you're asking us to change our, to people, you're asking people who don't agree with paying property taxes to change their attitude towards the fact that we have to pay those taxes. Is that fair? Statement? That we, there are reasons why we should also. Yeah. Okay, so you're trying to persuade those of us who maybe sort of begrudgingly pay taxes to the public school system that we should really see this as a positive. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify uh, that. I have a couple other questions real quick. Um, do we really benefit from public education? Um, I think that might be a debatable point. Um, think of all the evils uh, by nature, godless. Is education that is godless better than no education at all? In other words, by taking God out of school, right, and teaching people that um, that that He doesn't matter, right, to what they're learning, right? is that a real? Is that a benefit? Um, and I'm just sort of pushing back on that that, that point that public education it, we all benefit from it. Well, isn't that what's leading our society down a completely secular path that will ultimately to God's judgment. Well, I'm more saying that we should subsidize them. I would um, I'm sorry, you did you said it was a provisional good, right? So I'm just trying to um, get to the um, one of the core of your first arguments was that public education is a benefit, right? that we all benefit from. It. Um, and, and to some extent, I agree with what you're saying in the sense that you know it's good that our society learns to read and write. And you can learn that, right? But you also can't escape the fact, I think, that uh, you can learn to read and write and, and do math is a good thing. You know, we're also in our public education system teaching kids that God doesn't matter and that uh, you know that he, he's not important to their lives because we exclude them from everything. We don't welcome them into the education. So I'm just kind of curious as, you know, is that a real benefit as opposed to you know? so in other words, you think you, your answer would be it is still a benefit. Is that right? Okay. Even though we do exclude let me go to another point here. Why, 
why not subsidize all schools? Why not, why just, I mean, if your argument is that we, that our public, that our property taxes should subsidize school, public schools, well, why just public schools? Why not all schools? Aren't we all providing a public benefit? Aren't we all teaching kids to read and write? And aren't we all providing for the, their educational needs? So why exclude from our property taxes? You know, so let's say I accept your thesis that it, we, ought, we ought to willingly and with a happy heart pay our property taxes to support schools. But my question is, why just public schools? Well, um, our local property taxes are taken from through the government, and so our taxes are used to pay for the public schools. Since it's the government's money, they have the right to control what they teach. So if we did that, then the government would have the opportunity and want to control what we teach our teachers. Okay, so um, you think that we shouldn't, as a private school, take the government's money um, because then we, they would control what we teach. Um, okay, that's a fair answer. Uh, Abby, I'm interested to know if you think there are lines that should not be crossed within this realm of public taxation and uh, subsidizing public schools. Because it's one thing to say that it's a provisional good, and it's another thing to say that it's uh, automatically a provisional good. Are there, are there lines that should be crossed? And I'm not necessarily asking you to put percentages in terms of, well, if, they, if the property tax became 50%, uh, you know, it would be so overwhelming that no one would possibly be able to afford it. Uh, you know, so that's, I'm just interested to hear from you if you had any thoughts in the course of your research about boundaries that there should be around how much subsidization there is. Well, the property taxes are calculated by how much land you have or your property. And a percentage of that is given to the public schools. So it's not, there aren't property taxes because the schools need to be subsidized. There's property taxes and the schools, like they're gonna be there anyway. So whether or not we subsidize public schools. Okay, thank you. I thought you did a really good job of definitions. Um, and at appropriate times throughout. Um, there's some definitions in there I wasn't quite sure of, so I was glad that you gave them throughout. Um, I, I have some questions just on the information in your, in your thesis. Um, you talked about, um, I believe it's on page three of your thesis, that about the local property taxes are gradually becoming less and less important in public school funding. And then um, over on page eight, you say 85% of the funding in DC comes from local taxes. That seems like it'd be hard to come down from. Well, it just depends on the state. Because Columbia is so little that their state funding is also very little. So the local and the government funding kind of get over. But depending on the state, those property taxes are becoming. Do you have numbers for Texas? I know that last year, I, the number the, of New Aces County, the, the total number of property taxes was almost two hundred and three million dollars. For tax policy, you don't know the percentage of the total amount it cost to run. Um, let's see. that do not devote themselves to educating their young people. What are some examples of those countries? I don't have examples of those countries, but I'm just trying to think about this. Oh, um, I, I kind of took it personally um, over on page, I think it's about page six for us. Um, it says that, that the public schools are used to create citizens, keep jobs, and socialize. 
Without public schools, there would be no citizens to help others and benefit others. No is a very <laughs> big word. Uh, what about us? I was going, what about me? Okay, um, and I don't know, when everybody is paying for everybody, I mean, when you're paying taxes, the more stuff you have, the more taxes you're going to pay, right? Okay. If you have a big, huge house, you're going to pay more money, right? Okay. And so you're going to pay more taxes. You're going to be subsidizing the school system from your wealth. How is that not socialism? So it's, it's a rough issue, but I think you did a real organized good job of presenting. Abby, are you familiar at all with um, the voucher system uh, proposals? I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Why is that? So um, what about the idea of a tax credit for um, you know, people who have school-aged children so that you know, they're not the government, in other words, you know, you know the different, do you understand the difference between like a tax credit and, and, and a voucher? So um, a tax credit would be, you know, we all pay property taxes, but instead um, there are, are those who have kids right, who would be exempt from property. So I tend to agree with you about the idea. I don't, the last thing in the world I would want is the government, you know, uh, with its bureaucracies and red tape and uh, inefficiencies, uh, trying to cover an uh, institution like Annapolis. Um, I, I, would, I would protest that, you know, my dying day, right? Um, I'm just wondering, do we want government involved in education? Um, you know, there's the current debate over Healthcare, right? And the idea here is that we've had a system of private healthcare, and it's pretty, pretty good, and you know, not perfect. We need some improvements and things like that. But the idea then is that the government can take over healthcare, provide it universally, and the fear is that that's going to ruin it. <laughs> I'm wondering if the same thing is true of the government take over of education, uh, and and whether it would be better to get back to a system where. Just subject to the private market, not a government control. Uh, and I'm just curious if your thoughts on that. Not really following what you're saying. Sorry. Uh, um, I guess what happened? When did public education? When was public education instituted in our country? 1840. 1840. So what was education like before 18? local communities, churches, um, so people weren't uneducated. And I'm wondering what it would be like if we went back to something like that, you know, local communities. What would be your opinion on that? Where, um, you know, it wasn't a government control thing, but it was locally or locally controlled through parents. And
you know, those were too far down the road. Uh, public school systems are here to stay. We just need to accept it and cheerfully give it to it. We just have a, um, a couple minutes left. Are there any questions from the audience? A similar question to what Mr. Keller said. Um, where do you think subsidiz subsidization, subsidi subsidization. <laughs> or public school system, where do you think that crosses the line on some things? Like, um, uh, say, athletics, like sports fields, uh, aquatic centers, similar things. Do you think that some sort of, uh, property tax money taken from the property taxes should? Sh should just go to the education or should it also go to the athletics of the school? Well, depending on the school, they kind of choose how they spend it. But I think it should go for education more than athletics. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Karen Lawrence, and uh, I wanted to follow up on a question that Mr. Hanson was working on, and he said that, you said that uh, the taxes that we pay subsidize education through the government. And so the government gets a say, because we pay taxes to the government, they get the say of what is taught in the classroom. Is that a, is that a true statement for you? Is that what you were saying? Um, when we pay taxes to the government, essentially, in my view, we are laundering money. And we give it to the government, and it comes back, instead of just our money, as government money. Because the Constitution says, we the people of the United States. So the government is the people, or is the people. We are the government. Therefore, we should have a say when it comes to what's taught in our public schools that our money is provided. What's that? Pardon? What? Do you understand what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. Okay, do you, is that something you would agree with or not? Any other questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question. Uh, why should the government be able to choose what we are learning in our schools when our parents pay the taxes, and we children are the ones learning. I, what I'm trying to say is that if our parents pay the taxes and we kids learn, we should be able to choose what we want to learn and what we should learn about. And right now, I don't think that's happening in our government. So do you think that your theory was, is correct that we should give money to the government for them to pick what we learn? Or do you think that we should be able to pick what we want to work? Well, I think we should still give our money to the government, but the government should give us the option to choose and the say in what we want. 
and that will be the last question. We are out of time. argument, 
this will be the age group I will be referencing. In May of 2011, several patients at Quality Care Assisted Living were found to be severely abused. According to the Criminal Investigation Report, patients were found on the toilet with heavy bags filled with feces and urine tied around their necks. When the bags were removed, deep red marks were found, which indicated that the bags had been tied around them for long periods of time. The woman responsible for this injustice, Nahima Griffin, said that clients needed to learn not to soil themselves, and that's why the bags were placed around their necks. This is the extent one takes to teach a lesson. Griffin was accused of two counts of injury to an elderly with intent to cause bodily injury, which is a third degree felony. This facility was closed down after the accounts of abuse were made public. Because during the investigation, more evidence was found to show that residents were neglected and subjected to repeated verbal and physical abuse according to the inspector's reports. Griffin was on trial for these cases this past month in April of 2013 and has been sentenced to four years in prison. Did I mention that this abuse was happening right here in Corpus Christi? This is just one example that shows you that in our everyday lives, the elderly are being abused all around us. Literally, all around us. One might think that the elderly would be treated appropriately in nursing homes or assisted living facilities. However, the increasing reports of abuse tell us differently. In Lancaster, Pennsylvania, news reporter Mary Swigert wrote about a 65-year-old man who was reportedly abused by his personal care assistant, Mary Robinson. The police say that Robinson neglected her patient to a point where he developed skin ulcers that were very severe on his leg, foot, back, and genitals. After people learned of his predicament, he was checked into the local hospital, and eventually he was forced to have his right leg amputated. Mary Swigert, in her article, said that elder abuse was a growing problem in Lancaster County. In the last 10 years, the annual number of elder abuse cases reported to the Lancaster Office of, Office of Aging had nearly tripled. County reports of abuse jumped 71% in three years, according to the office figures. There were approximately 1,200 reports in 2010, compared to 700 in 2007. Reporter Mary Swigert talked to the Lancaster County District Attorney, Craig Stedman, about this rising issue. And he said, people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. That's part of the problem. The question is then, why do people not want to talk about the mistreatment of the elderly? Most often, people do not want to engage in subjects that make them feel responsible for the problem, uncomfortable, or guilty. John 3.19 says, This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. People want to hide their actions in the dark, so that the light of truth cannot expose their sin. Injustice against the elderly is a topic that people want to avoid precisely because it calls into question their morality. The above examples were just a brief overview of the many types of abuse they are victim to. Statistics has proven, and will continue to prove, that elder abuse is a trend. The National Center on Elder Abuse at the APHS conducted a study entitled The National Elder Abuse Incident Study in the Late 90s. According to the study, between 1986 and 1996, official reports of abuse and neglect throughout the country increased by 150%, while the total number of the elderly increased by only 10%. Okay, so what does this mean exactly? In the span of 10 years, the number of the elderly increased by only 10%. However, people reported abuse and neglect 150% more in those 10 years meaning that abuse against the elderly was growing, and new incidents of elder abuse and neglect were being reported to the Adult Protective Services at an all-time high. This report leads into my next point, that oftentimes abuse is not always reported to the authorities. According to the APS and Mesa, Arizona Police Department, only one in 14 incidents of elder abuse is reported to the authorities. The question might be asked, why is elder abuse reported so rarely? Karen Stina from the APS agency said that oftentimes elder abuse is not reported because the abuse has visions of self-blame, 
fear of retaliation from the abuser, fear of not being believed, or fear of the criminal justice system. And in many cases, they are just unable to. Let's look from the perspective of someone who is being abused in a care facility. You are old, tired, and worn out. You have weathered some of life's awful storms, and you thought you had seen the last of its ferocious winds. However, here you are, again, in a storm that you feel you can never escape from. You feel unloved, abandoned, and a burden. You are abused daily and can do little to stop the nightmare. You are in a very vulnerable position, and anything you say could potentially make your predicament worse. Now let's look from the perspective of someone who is aware of the abuse, but does not help. This person might feel like it would not make a difference. They could have the mindset that if it's going to happen, it will, regardless of whether I say something or not. Now just think what it would be like if everyone had this mindset. It would be a storm with no end and no rays of sunshine to counteract with the pouring rain of abuse. One cannot underestimate their own voice. One cannot underestimate what doing the right thing will accomplish. A wise man once said, it's the action, not the fruit of the action that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power, may not be in your time, that there'll be any results, but that doesn't mean you stop doing the right thing. Because if you don't do the right thing, nothing will come from your actions. Not only did Gandhi say this, but also someone with much weightier authority. The brother of Jesus, James, said anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. We as a society are departing from the biblical standard of how to care for the elderly. To depart from the biblical standard is to sin. Listen carefully to these statistics which illustrate what happens when people do stray from the biblical standard. They may shock you. University of Denver's Clinic and Geriatric Medicine Center conducted a study that stated it is believed that in the United States, over 2 million older adults are mistreated each year. The U.S. Administration on Aging's National Center on Elder Abuse confirmed that statistic as well saying that an average of 2 million adults, aged 65 and older, are victimized annually. A survey in 2000 was conducted by the National Association of APS as a response to the abuse of elderly adults. In this survey, they found 470,000 reports of elder abuse in both domestic and institutional settings. However, in the 1986 report, there had been only 11,700 reports of elder abuse. In the following year, in 1987, nearly 130,000 reports. Now jumping into the 21st century, we are still seeing a steady increase based on the 2004 survey of State Adult Protective Services. APS received a total of 560,000 reports of elder abuse. This represents a 20% increase from the 2000 survey. Kathy Greenland, Secretary for Aging at the administration in Washington, D.C., says that the direct costs associated with elder financial exploitation were estimated to be $2.9 billion in 2009, a 12% increase from 2008. These reported elder abuse statistics clearly show that as the years go by, the types of abuse towards the elderly increases, and people are continuing to abandon the biblical standard of how the elderly should be treated, thought of, and cared for. I have been talking about the biblical standard but you may be wondering what exactly that is. So let's start at the beginning. I hear it's a very good place to start. The beginning of the biblical standard starts in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19.32 says, You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. According to commentator Matthew Henry, this verse is a charge to young people to show respect to the age. Those who God has honored blessing of long life, we ought to honor with the distinguished expressions of civility. Biblically, this is the way we should view and treat the elderly. The Lord of the cosmos is telling us that elderly people deserve to be respected with the honor that is due them. The fourth commandment says to honor your father and mother so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Matthew Henry interpreted this verse to mean it includes esteem of them, obedience to their lawful Come when they call you, go where they send you, and do what they bid you. 
endeavoring in everything to comfort parents and to make their old age easy. Old Testament scholar John Walton has similar views as Henry, however he takes it one step further. Walton says most ancient Israelites would have understood this as a requirement to care for one's elderly parents. They would take this command very seriously, because if they did not, they would not live long in the land. The responsibility was on the children to provide and support their aging parents in all aspects, which could include bringing their parents into their own home. Honoring their father and mother was not a choice, but rather a command they felt privileged to obey. So you might be wondering, what if someone is unable to properly care for their aging parents medically? If this were the case, it would be the children's responsibility to find the best suited living facility for their parents, and the children would need to visit them frequently once they were there. Visiting often would ensure that abuse against their parent was not happening all the time. A prime example of what this might look like can be seen through the life of our very own Harrison Ross. Mr. Ross's mother lives here in Corpus Christi. Due to her age and health limitations, she is unable to live independently. She is also unable to live with Mr. Ross because he would not be able to properly care for her health-wise. For that reason, Mr. Ross found a suitable assisted living home for his mom. Now, did he just leave her there, never go to see her, and just hope she would be treated well? No. Mr. Ross visits his mother every Saturday, taking her out to shop for whatever she needs to live adequately. To guarantee that she takes her pills daily, he sends someone to monitor this process. He also has a nanny take his four-year-old daughter to visit her grandma throughout the week. Mr. Ross is doing exactly what the biblical standard of caring for your aging parents looks like in a post-industrial civilization. He is honoring his mother by consistently being in her life. This consistency is proof of his love, devotion, and commitment to his mom. This consistency is also proof of his love, devotion, and commitment to God, who has commanded his children to honor their father and mother. The biblical description of how we should treat the elderly, as seen in the life of Mr. Ross, does not line up with our current sightings of the definition of caring for the elderly. If putting an elderly person in care facilities is either, is either the result of disobeying God's word or simply being ignorant, but abuse in those facilities follows. One could then say that based on the rising number of abuse cases, the obvious conclusion is that abandoning the biblical paradigm, either through disobedience or ignorance, leads to heightened numbers of elder abuse. Fixing the care facilities does not fix the problem. However, changing the way people interpret the biblical standard of caring for the elderly establishes the beginning of a solution. When one is proposing a change to the accepted and normal way of life, it is easier to set smaller goals to help accomplish the overall goal. One way to help detect and deal with elder abuse could be to create care groups that would go to nursing homes and be able to identify the signs of abuse the elderly are fighting against. In these groups, there would be a professional advisor who would be certified to educate the members of each group concerning abuse and the elderly. Churches have youth groups and home groups. Why couldn't we start a new type of group that would really be able to also, there are many churches in the city of Corpus Christi. There are also many nursing and retirement homes in the city. Why couldn't each church adopt a nursing home? Each church would be able to visit their own nursing home and build relationships with the residents there. This would be a deep, intimate way of showing God's love to his people. Both of these ideas embody a larger vision for Christians to rise up and take ownership of. However, Rome was not built in a day, but rather brick by brick. Smaller steps in achieving these larger goals could be as simple as calling your grandparents more often. You can try visiting a nursing home once a month, and then as time goes on, make it a more frequent habit. Elderly people love to receive letters. Do you guys remember what that is? It's where you, you get a piece of paper, and you write words on it, and then you put it in a mailbox to send to someone. Taking time to write them a personalized note could make their day, week, or even month. Also, how are you treating your parents right now? Do you treat them right now? Will make a difference for how you will honor and treat them in their old age. The habits and patterns formed now will follow you to when you must care for your parents in the future. You may have heard that it takes a village to raise a child, but I say that it takes a village to, raise, to care for the elderly. In this village, people
people could choose to be more aware of the elderly people around them. People could choose to educate themselves concerning the statistics of abuse elderly people undergo in the very city we are living in. Sharing awareness of elder abuse is vital in making a difference and changing how they are being treated. If you could make a difference, wouldn't you? Abuse against the elderly is real. The biblical standard of how we should view and treat the elderly is real too. Is the current way of how the elderly are being treated appropriate? Clearly it is not. Is this the way you want to treat others? Clearly it is not. Honor, care, love, devotion, commitment, loyalty. Is this not how you want to be treated in your old age? Take a stand for the elderly. Be there. Shadow, great topic. Um, it's it's kind of hard to push back on this topic because it's um, you know uh, hard to argue that we shouldn't be caring for the elderly like you're advocating. I, I I'm just curious in a general way why you chose this topic. What's your interest in it? You did seem very passionate about it. So I was curious about that. Okay. Um, I would say that I first really got involved with um, visiting and caring for the elderly when I was about 12 when I first met an elderly lady in my church, her name was Blanche Johnson, and we 
we started a really sweet friendship, and we started writing letters over time. And then we, we, I would um, take her blueberries that were in the big Mississippi. So that's how that relationship started. So she was moved into a, an assisted living facility. So I began to visit her about once a week. And then she was moved to different residents. But every time she moved, I would go, I would go and visit her once, once a week. Because just the look on her face when I would walk through the door, it, it would light up. She, she had, you know, sometimes she would have daughters that lived here, but they wouldn't be able to see her very frequently. So she used to say that I was like her granddaughter. And just the reality of the happiness that it made her feel when I walked through that door, I think that is what has been pushing me and giving me this passion because it really makes a difference. One visit once a week can make a difference in their lives as they are, as they are aging and as their own children might not really be able to visit them. I was curious, your topic made me think of an instance where I saw, um, did you watch the recent Super Bowl? You know how they have the commercials, things like that? We only get two channels out in the country. Okay, so, so you didn't know. <laughs> I'll describe it to you and ask you to comment on it in a general way uh, about your opinion. Um, it was during the Super Bowl and it was from Taco Bell and the theme of it was, um, I don't know, living well or, you know, uh, weaving it, or, you know. It, it, anyway, it, it depicted this whole scene of these elderly people escaping from an assisted care facility, you know, and getting in a car, you know, that was, you know, bouncing, right, uh, hydraulics, and and then they went out to a nightclub, you know, and they're pulling out their teeth, and they're drinking alcohol, and they're, they're partying, and then they go and jump in a skinny dipping in a pool, and then they, you know, you know, it's this late night thing, and I remember thinking at the time, wow, I don't really know what to think about that commercial. What's that trying to say? about our elderly, is that disrespectful? Um, part of me wanted to say, yeah, that seems really disrespectful. Another part, it could be argued, could be, well, this is just showing that they still have a lot of life in them, and you know, it's not that bad to be so old. I don't know, I'm just curious, as a, as a society, what is the role of the media, maybe, in perpetuating disrespect towards the elderly? Do you see that as an issue or, or a problem? Uh, what well, I would say, My first thought when you first talk, when you started talking that, like they went to get the elderly out of the facility, which kind of makes you think like they're like they're trying to help them escape. Well, why do why do they need to be you know, saved from a facility? Because they are undergoing abuse in those facilities. And so I think that would be a legitimate point for that commercial. But also the media and the elderly. I was I, I was just thinking of like other commercials. We're we're so into you know when you get gray hair. Oh my goodness. Cover it up quick. Here's here's all the products to. We don't want to look like we're aging. We don't want to look like we're getting older. That's like one of the big things, you know. But then when you read, you know, verses in Proverbs where it's saying to honor, you know, like people with gray hair, they have esteem, they have honor. It's not something to be you know, to wish that you didn't have that. So I would say that the media definitely play. You know, they definitely do give a negative light on elderly people. Because usually, and especially, you know, when people are like, well, what if I just don't want to go to a nursing home? You know, elderly people, they stink, they're going to they're gonna bark at me, they don't even know what texting is. You know, it's like, well, obviously, I know some elderly people, that they, they're trying to, you know, stay with the times, they're trying to adapt. But why do we just want them to come up with us? Why can't we also, in their generation, letters were important? Eye-to-eye, -eye, face contact is important. Why can't we, if we want them to come and change with us too, why can't we give them that same, that, you know, the same thing of trying to think back to their generation and also trying to just balance and balance and make that relationship. My last question, um, what about elderly without kids? I think you were advocating that, that kids should take care of their parents as a first line you know, of care. But what about the elderly without anybody? What is the role of society or particularly government in, in this uh, the issue of caring for the elderly? Right. When I'm talking about churches adopting a nursing home, when I first 
thought of that idea, it really was because, you know, not all people have children, right? So if they're in a nursing home or assisted living facility, who is there to be their advocate to say, hey, abuse is happening right there, it needs to stop. That's why if churches would each have a specific nursing home that they're going to visit frequently, that people without children, they would have the church as an advocate, and also the, the groups that would be going out to see Shiloh, I appreciated that. I worked in a nursing home for years in high school and through nursing school. So, uh, and I have seen the people giving excellent care to those people back then receiving really bad care now. So I do appreciate your call to for people to open their eyes and be aware of the situation. Um, I had some questions about just some of your statistics and that kind of thing, okay? Um, you talked about the total number of cases rising or the total percent rising. Well, we all know there are more baby, baby boomers getting older and older and more people going into nursing homes. Um, how do all these increase in numbers of cases correlate with the increase in number of people actually being in nursing homes? Did you find any of that? How the increase in number of people in nursing homes is being, is correlated with the abuse that they're undergoing or? Yeah, you were saying that the cases have increased by 110% or whatever. Um, does that take into consideration how many more people are in nursing homes now just because of our aging population? Right, yes, and uh, that is a good point. And also, as, as the baby boomers, you know, right, we're getting more elderly people, I found an interesting statistic that said by 2030, there will be about 71.5 million older people, and that's almost twice the amount that was in 2004. So, so just the fact of why this is so important now for our future generation is we need to change the mindset that they have towards the elderly right now because there are going to be, the number of the elderly is going to be continuing to increase as the years go by. And we don't want, as the number of the elderly increases, we don't want the amount of abuse that they have in you know, all the reports. We don't want that to increase with the number. So I think that's why right now it's important to change that. Another question I have was, um, the people that are the ones that are the main caregivers in the nursing homes are nurses' aides. Did you research any kind of training that the nurses' aides are given specifically for elder care? Briefly, but not as much. Um, I actually, I go to nursing homes every year. I mean, every week, sorry. And, um, <laughs> and I have friends that are nursing, nursing there. And they have said that like my one friend, she's still in college, but she, the training that they, under, like, that she had to go, like, undergo right when she first was, like, started working there was probably, like, a week. So she's coming from, like, you know, a high school education. She has her diploma, but she's not even, she hasn't even taken, like, real nursing courses that would help her be able to even know how to properly care for them or treat them. So I think definitely the, the length of time and the certification that nurses have Good, thank you. Um, I had one more question. Um, you, I'm not understanding the logic in this, but if putting an elderly person in care facilities is either the result of disobeying God's word or simply being ignorant, abuse in those facilities follows. I don't understand the connection. Well, I'm saying that obviously some people do not, they don't realize the, the abuse that does undergo in those nursing facilities. So, that is the ignorance part, and the disobedience would be where, say, a parent is like they're just they're fed up, like they can't care for their parent any longer in their house. They have six kids, they just can't do it, so they're just like, you know what? We just need to put them in a facility. They'll be okay there. I think that would be where their mindset is going in this in the path of the disobedience. So I'm saying that if we're abandoning that biblical paradigm, either through the ignorance, people don't know what the abuse of those undergoes, or the disobedience that abuse in those facilities is going to follow because they are not going to be consistently visiting or being in their care of their parents. Okay, thank you. Well, we have just a, a moment here for a few audience questions. Any questions? Shiloh, when do you think it would be appropriate to put an elderly person into a nursing home, besides being financially in trouble. You're saying it's like what other, other than financially? 
Um, now, what other conditions would you say would be appropriate then to put an elderly, elderly person into a nursing home? Right. Well, like in Mr. Ross's case, his mother medically, he's not, he's, he's unable to properly care for her medically in his own household because of the different types of her, the health that she's undergoing right now. So I would say definitely health-wise. And even with my own grandpa, he used to live with us, and we we couldn't properly care for him because of all of his conditions. So we had to. Time for two more questions. Three. Most of the elderly that are in these nursing homes aren't able to um, aren't able to take care of themselves. That's why they're placed in these facilities. So I would assume their quality of life is not as um, up to par as it should be, um, and they're not really uh, helping out society in certain ways. They're costing money. Um, and uh, if it were me, you know, the church says, don't others as you have no view. If it, I was in that situation, I don't know if I would want to continue on. And, I mean, you lived on a farm. Uh, I, I, you've experienced what yellow firsthand. And so um, what's the difference between your horse out back and just, you know, taking care of our grandparents? Right. Well, I would say that that is also another mindset that some people have. But that calls into question, who are we as humans to determine the length of someone's life should be? Because I believe that God has created us all for the beginning of time, and He is the one who is judged over the limit of how long our life should be, and not other humans. Very nicely done, Trey. Um, question. I know you do so much reading, um, just to prepare for your thesis. Is there any author or book that perhaps would you do that you weren't able to include? C.S. Lewis, we all love him around here, right? I was reading and by surprise by joy, and it was interesting in that he made a promise with his friend Edward that who, they were in the middle of the war, and whoever died, the other person, if they survived, would care for their family and their parents specifically throughout their life. So Lewis was the one that survived, and he went and visited Edward's mother. She had dementia, so she was put in a nursing home. And he went and visited her every day in the nursing home until she passed away. So I would say that that is the main example from C.S. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Shai. Her joyful attitude, 
Golden Heart, and Humble Spirit will help her be successful with her future career and help her make friends wherever life takes her. Today, Haley will be discussing the different types of euthanasia, explaining what they mean and where they are legal. Please join me in welcoming my lovely friend, Haley Atkins. not 
claim the doctor as evil and does not make him responsible for the killing of another person. I believe that passive euthanasia is moral and active euthanasia is immoral and in no circumstance should be allowed now. In 2010, of all deaths in the Netherlands, 2 to 8 percent, which was 475 of 6,800, were the result of euthanasia. This rate is higher than the previous 1 to 7 percent in 2005, but comparable with those in 2001 and 1995. Distribution of sex, age, and diagnosis was stable between 1990 and 2010. In 2010, 77 percent, which is 3,100 of 4,000, of all cases of euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide were reported to a review committee. 2005. Continuous deep sedation until death occurred more frequently in 2010 than in 2005. Of all deaths in 2010, 0 to 4 percent, which is 18 of 6,800, were the result of the patient's decision to stop eating and drinking to end life. In half of these cases, the patient had made a euthanasia request that was not granted. Although a huge argument that people have against euthanasia is that if someone wants to die, they should just be able to. This is wrong. There is a major difference between someone who is sick in a hospital and wants to die because they are mentally and physically tired and someone who is in a coma on a ventilator. The difference is due to the fact that our society has different ideas of what living and dying are. In this speech, I will define living as someone who is awake enough to talk and comprehend their surroundings, someone who has their eyes open and can look around, or someone who can at least hear what's going on around them and respond with a hand squeeze or some sort of nonverbal communication. I will define dying as someone who is unable to do the above actions and is virtually brain dead. They're on life support, and the doctors tell the family there is no hope of them recovering due to some type of traumatic experience. In Psalm 139, 16, it says, All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This means that God knows exactly when we will die. The argument of people wanting to end their lives because they are in so much pain, have no will to live, etc., is invalid, for God has already planned it out and he can take the person's life whenever he wants to. This is absolutely true and leads to another point, the slippery slope or Holy Grail argument. In Monty Python and the Holy Grail, there is a scene where the dead collector goes by yelling, bring out your dead. The man in question is clearly not dead, and he keeps saying, I'm not dead yet. But the collectors say that he will be soon because he's very ill. They go ahead and take him. The question of the slippery slope for euthanasia is as follows. How large is the gap between killing someone because they are dying and killing someone because they are of a different race, religion, etc. If euthanasia were to become legal, doctors could start killing people because they are a burden to society. They could euthanize the elderly and the sick, or maybe the mentally retarded, or perhaps the children who are deaf or blind or have other birth defects. The gap is too close between euthanasia to eugenics, otherwise known as compulsory sterilization. Compulsory sterilization, also known as forced sterilization, are government policies which attempt to force people to undergo surgical sterilization. Most Americans do not realize that, that there is a massive problem with eugenics in the United States, even up until the 1960s. Eugenics was used to suppress birth rates of racial minorities. Today, over 90% of children prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. New tests are emerging that allow women to see if their child may be born with Down syndrome, autism, other cognitive disabilities, or even physical ailments. These tests are advertised as a way to determine whether a child is suitable for a quality life, and whether such a disability would suit his or her parents' lifestyle. Sterilization programs 
that were practiced in North Carolina in the 1960s were recently in the news. These programs were meant to keep undesirables, blacks, mentally handicapped people, and low-income women from having children and passing on these undesirable traits. People are appalled that something so immoral could be implemented on a group of people who were their neighbors, friends, and family. Yet they continue to allow Planned Parenthood and other abortion facilities into their neighborhoods and communities with the main objective to decrease the number of minority and low-income pregnancies and births. One of the most well-known men to ever participate in eugenics was Adolf Hitler. Hitler and his followers victimized an entire continent and exterminated millions in his quest for a so-called master race. But the concept of a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed master race didn't originate with Hitler. The idea was created right here in the United States and perfected in California decades before Hitler came to power. California eugenicists played an important, although little-known role in the American eugenics movement's campaign for ethnic cleansing. Eugenics was the racist pseudoscience determined to wipe away all human beings unfit, preserving only those who conform to a perfect stereotype. Elements of the philosophy were enshrined as national policy by forced sterilization and segregation laws, as well as marriage restrictions enacted in 27 states. In 1909, California became the third state to adopt such laws. According to the Oxford Handbook of the History of Eugenics, eugenics practitioners coercively sterilized some 60,000 Americans, barred the marriage of thousands, forcibly segregated thousands in colonies, and persecuted untold numbers in ways we are just learning. Before World War II, nearly half of coercive sterilizations were done in California. And even after the war, the state accounted for a third of all such surgeries. In the first half of the 20th century, Several such programs were instituted in countries around the world, usually as part of eugenics programs intended to prevent the reproduction and multiplication of members of the population considered to be carriers of defective genetic traits. To kill someone because they are not looked at as genetically pure is a sick and twisted thing to do. In 1 John 3, 15 through 16, it says, everyone who hates his brother is and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. We are called to love everyone, because everyone is our brother and sister through Christ. Back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, sin came into our world. As humans who have fallen from grace, it is not hard to imagine we could easily cross the line from something that could be legalized in the future, something such as euthanasia, to murder. In Belgium, doctors are harvesting lungs from patients who have been euthanized because the organs are in much better condition compared to someone who has died in an accident, according to a study published in the journal Applied Cardiopulmonary Pathophysiology. So could this medical practice happen here in the U.S. someday? Well, it's not likely since euthanasia is not legal here in the United States. But one medical ethicist from Wake Forest University in North Carolina said it does not seem that out of the ordinary in a country where this practice is legal. Insofar as euthanasia has been legalized in Belgium, it's hard to see why they wouldn't want to take organs for transplantation said Anna Idis, director of the Center for Bioethics Health and Society at Wake Forest University. People tend to respond with an, ugh, but that response should be about euthanasia, not organ transplants. Once you accept that physicians are going to kill patients, it seems only logical that they would also harvest those organs for transplantation. Dr. Peter Saunders of the group Care Not Killing which is a UK-based alliance opposed to euthanasia, expressed to the Daily Telegraph that he is very concerned about what is unfolding in Belgium. 
Given that half of all euthanasia cases in Belgium are involuntary, it must be only a matter of time before the organs are taken from patients who are euthanized without their consent, Saunders told the Telegraph. The matter-of-fact way the retrieval process is described in the paper is particularly chilling and shows the degree of collaboration that is necessary between the euthanasia team and the transplant surgeons. They prep them for theater next to the operating room, then kill them and wheel them in for organ retrieval. All in a day's work in Great New Belgium. Doctors there are now doing things that most doctors in other countries would find absolutely horrific. Ida said a 2010 report by the Canadian Medical Association highlighted the fact that 66 out of 208 patients in Belgium were euthanized without explicit patient requests. And that's very worrisome. You can imagine cases. Maybe the patient's family requested it. But the law, as I understand, requires an explicit patient request, she said. In the Netherlands, there were 3,695 reported active euthanasia deaths in 2011 alone. The fact that something like this is happening in countries with good medical care and good reputations concerning medical issues is absolutely terrifying. Here in the U.S., some states like Oregon and Montana have legalized physician-assisted suicide, which is much different. The laws vary from state to state, but with physician-assisted suicide, the patient would receive a prescription from the doctor for some pills and kill themselves on their own time. Whereas with active euthanasia, the doctor or nurse can directly inject a lethal cocktail into a patient's IV. Although physician-assisted suicide is more closely related to active euthanasia than passive, it is still considered moral since the doctor is not directly euthanizing someone. It is now in the patient's hands, which is the same thing as suicide, and that is legal. In the U.S., Dr. Jack Kevorkian, also known as Dr. Death, successfully challenged the law on euthanasia, avoiding prosecution for conducting medically assisted suicides across the country for 10 years. In a landmark 1999 decision, however, he was sent to prison for 10 to 25 years for administering a lethal injection. In Ecclesiastes 3.2, it says, there is an appointed time to be born and an appointed time to die. This means that no doctor has the right to play God and kill someone. The Bible tells us that all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Only God knows when our last breath will happen, and we must keep that in mind when we consider things like euthanasia. This subject is growing all over the world as technology and medicine increase. More and more countries and states are changing laws either for or against you. It is so important that doctors stay true to both Hippocratic oaths and remember that they are here to help patients live, not to help patients die. Diverse and growing topic. Due to the increase in countries who take part in this act, it is a larger problem now than ever before. When we are put into the situation of watching a loved one suffer, there is no doubt that it is difficult. Let me ask you a question. If you had to watch a family member friend, or spouse, lie in a hospital bed, emotionless and near death, would you rather see them murdered by a doctor with a lethal injection, or see them go peacefully from this world to heaven in God's time? In James 4, 13-15, the Bible says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen to what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. We are to make wise decisions about how we live our lives and how we take care of ourselves. And ultimately, we must trust God that he is sovereign and in control of all things. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I'm going to ask you a 
the same, same question I asked uh, Shiloh to begin with. Just, um, I'm curious about what motivated you to pick this as a topic. Um, what was your interest in the subject? I knew that I wanted to do something in the medical area because that really interests me. And I was looking for something more along the lines of surgery, like something to do with surgery and statistics and stuff. But I ran across euthanasia and thought it was really intriguing. I started researching it and really liked it and decided that I would go ahead and stick it out. And here I am. In a, if you could, in one sentence, um, state your the thesis of your presentation, how would you, say, how would you want to do that? I believe that active euthanasia is immoral and should remain illegal, and passive euthanasia is moral. Okay. Um, tell me about um, your definition of moral again, because that's kind of where I, um, I'm hung up a little bit. Um, active euthanasia is moral. You seem to use the Hippocratic oath as kind of a, your, your standard word of morality. Is that, uh, or for your definition of morality, is that accurate? Yes. Okay, so in the uh, Hippocratic oath, as the ancient version or the modern version? Um, both, both, but more so the modern. Is, is the Hippocratic Oath the, the thing that determines the morality of um, this issue? No. But in your speech or in your presentation, are you, are you, are you using that as your, the basis for your moral distinction? Um, I'm not using it as a basis, but I use it to back to back. Okay, so you're, you're using it um, not as the basis of um, morale, determining morality, but as the basis of determining whether a doctor should or should not like, practice this? Doctors, doctors should have a moral basis on their own of whether it's okay to kill someone or not, and hopefully they all think it's not okay. Because like I said, doctors are here to help patients live. So they should want to kill people. Hopefully they take that into account as well. Is there ever a situation you can imagine? Um, think of a, of a terrible um, illness, terminal, suffering, pain ridden, racked, horrible illness. Um, to end that suffering rather than 